for the introduction. Um, yes, today I'm going to talk about the experimental models of pain for research. I hope you can um, enjoy this talk. Um, overall goals of this presentation is looking into different existing animal models that are in preclinical pain research, uh, and it can help with very exchange of ideas and finding the best combination of preclinical and clinical studies to get the best results. As an example, uh, uh, in preclinical research, uh, it was um, mostly uh, male rodents and young ones that were used. But now, as we, we know that chronic pain patients are mostly women in older ages. So uh, researchers started to use both sexes and uh, like modify their experimental design to fit more into clinical context. So this is really important. So with all the discussion, it, can, uh, it will be helpful for modification of current models or development of new models. Um, and it leads to translation of data, a better translation of data from basic science to clinical research. Um, my presentation will have four major parts today. The first one is uh, that we will look into why we need animal models. The second will be uh, talking about different pain induction methods in animals. Uh, and then we will go into how to assess this pain in animals, how to quantify the pain in them. And then we will have the conclusion and question and answer. Uh, the first part of the presentation is that why we need uh, experimental pain models, why we need these animals. Uh, the most important reason is that we can do mechanistic studies in animals. And how's that? Uh, it's because we can recreate a painful condition and uh, we have a complete, almost complete control over that uh, painful condition. Uh, for example, you can control the age, all of the animals can be in the same age, uh, they don't have lifestyle differences, they don't have a smoking status or anything like that, all these complications that happens in human uh, accords. Uh, the other important thing is that uh, we cannot have access to all the tissues uh, at any time point. For example, we can have access to DRG, brain, spinal cord, or any tissue that we think is important in pain. Uh, this thing is, again, really restricted in humans, too. Uh, the other important reason is that similarity in neuroanatomy and physiology among mammalians that really uh, can help us with finding more about the biology of pain. It can also be used, the similarity can also be used in drug target discovery and validation of those drugs. And the uh, last reason is that studies in humans are uh, ethically limiting and the pain that they report is a kind of subjective, but in animals, you can quantify the pain objectively. Uh, looking into this graph, it shows uh, the species that were selected for pain studies since 1963 to 2007. As you can see here, uh, mice and rat remains the like uh, most used, the mostly used animal uh, model in pain. Uh, there are some other models like dog, cat, or rabbit, but they're so rare. So today we will look into more um, of rodent models. And why is uh, that? Why rodent models are uh, this um, interesting and people use it a lot? Uh, first of all, it's because of its low cost and simplified ethical concerns. And uh, the other reason is that with the really importance of genetics in pain, uh, these rodent models let us uh, look into specific genes and important with transgenic mice. We can have knockout models to see um, how they behave without a gene or some insertions. And this is really helpful. And the other thing is that large database of prior research uh, there are a lot of uh, publicly available data sets out there uh, on rodents, so researchers can use them for both drug discovery and any other research that they want. Uh, we want to uh, reach the best match for our experimental designs, and what does that mean? It means that the in pain induction method should uh, mimic a specific clinical condition. 
and recreate all possible signs and symptoms of that condition, whether it's uh, coming from a disease, injury, surgery, chemical, or anything else, we should uh, be able to make exactly the same condition. And the second most important uh, thing is that, um, how are we going to measure that pain? Uh, the pain measurement method should recognize pain-like behaviors in a similar manner to the clinical experience of that pain and possibly recognize all possible signs that patients show. The pain induction methods that we are going to see today are different. There are many models out there, but I selected the um, more important ones. Uh, there are from different pain types, inflammatory, neuropathic cancer, arthritic, postoperative pain, muscle, and visceral pain. There are some other models, for example, diabetic neuropathy, alcoholism, and HIV-related neuropathy, which uh, there are models for that, but we are not going to look into them today. Uh, the first category, which is inflammatory pain, is um, usually made by injecting an irritant into different tissues, depending on the purpose of the study. Uh, it can be injected into skin, joint, muscle, paw, or visceral organs, face, or anywhere else. Uh, with that, we can have both acute inflammatory pain, which is associated with neutral recruitment, and sustained inflammatory pain, which is associated with microphage infiltration. Uh, the irritants that are injected can be categorized into main categories. The first ones are the ones that have direct effects on specific receptor or they are agonists or activators. Uh, uh, examples are formalin and capsaicin, but some other irritants are just like immune system activating substance, so they cause inflammation. Examples are carrageenan, CFA, urate crystals, and zymosome. Uh, the first irritant that can be injected for uh, causing inflammatory pain is uh, formalin. It's a formaldehyde in specific concentration, and it uh, causes, it creates a biphasic nociffensive behavior. Uh, the first phase happens within five minutes, and it works through activation of a specific uh, channel, which is called TRPA1. And then there will be a quiescent period and the second phase starts. It usually starts after 15 minutes. It increases the excitability of dorsal horn neurons too. So it has central sensitization. And how it works, it works through continuous nociceptive transmission uh, of uh, signals from type C fibers. Uh, the other um, used irritant is called capsaicin. As we know, it's a purified active ingredient of chili pepper. Uh, the sensory changes after this injection is ongoing burning and aching pain. Animals show thermal and mechanical hypersensitivity. Uh, after this injection, it activates TRPV1 uh, channel and nociceptors, and you can see this channel. Uh, sodium and calcium ions will flow through this channel into the cell and it will trigger the action potential. Uh, it's, uh, the thing about this uh, irritant is that it can also, it has been used in humans too. So it led or provides the ground for a translation between animals and humans. Uh, the last inflammatory irritant that uh, we want to look into is complete fraud adjuvant. It's first mostly used uh, irritant for making inflammatory pain models is uh, the cicadid mycobacterium, uh, which causes inflammation and is injected into animals. It produces mechanical and thermal hypersensitivity. It's a uh, use for making chronic inflammatory conditions that occur with rheumatoid arthritis and tendonitis. There are some other irritants that can be injected when we want to have inflammatory pain model. I just will name them. Uh, it can be carrageenan, uh, iodoacetate, zymosin, bee venom, mustard oil. It can be topical or injected. Uh, it can be acid. Inflammatory cytokines are sometimes injected too. And it can also be sodium urate crystals. 
the second uh, category of pain that we want to look into is neuropathic pain. As we know, it's caused by damage or disease related to the central uh, or peripheral nervous system. It can also happen after ischemia, metabolic derangement, or toxic exposure. Uh, there are models for uh, different affected regions of a central nervous system. There are models for cortical and thalamic pain, spinal cord injury pain, peripheral pain related to spinal nerves, sciatic nerves, and more distal branches. And it can also be a systemic neuropathy, like diabetic neuropathy and alcoholism. Uh, I should mention that uh, irritant in this um, pain model too, of an irritant close to sciatic nerve or orificial nerves. Um, just to have what are we going to see? Uh, this graph shows a number of studies that use these models. For example, actually used SNI CCI. And all these models touch one specific part of central nervous system. Depending on where to make the lesion, we will have different models. For example, it can be closer to DRGs. It can be like uh, further around spinal nerves, sciatic nerve. And depending on where to touch and how to touch, we have different models. The first mostly used pain model is a spinal nerve ligation. And how we make it, it's uh, made by tightly ligating the lumbar segmental of the spinal nerve uh, here L5 and L or L5 alone or L5 and L6 uh, without touching it for it. It uh, produces a partial denervation of a sciatic nerve among the symptoms that animals show after this surgery is allodynia and hyperalgesia, uh, which starts quickly after the surgery, for months. Uh, the next group that we want to look into is a spurred nerve injury. It again produces a partial denervation of sciatic nerve. It shows animals after the surgery show a very robust mechanical and thermal hyperalgesia, and it's very chronic, and it stays for a very, very long time, almost they don't resolve it, you can say. Uh, how is the surgery? It starts with opening the skin. Then you can access the seating nerve here, but you can see it's three branches. And then um, the model is made by cutting two of these branches, which are tibial and common perineal nerves and leave the third one uh, spurred. That's why it's called spurred nerve injury and closing the wound. Uh, the next model is chronic construction injury. It's the first animal model, which involves a partial injury of peripheral nerve. Uh, it mimics clinical conditions of chronic nerve compression, like entrapment neuropathy and lumbar disc herniation. Uh, and hypersensitivity after this surgery. Uh, this effect lasts for more than two months, but at the end, they resolve their pain. Uh, behavioral signs are um, a spontaneous pain and uh, mechanical and thermal hyperalgesia. This CCI can also be done in infrabital nerve uh, for making a trigeminal pain condition. procedure for the CCI, uh, you have to cut through uh, something between gluteus superficials and biceps femoris muscle and taking and tying four ligatures on it with around one millimeter uh, difference. And the model. The next model is uh, animal spinal cord injury. This is very valuable in better understanding the mechanisms involving traumatic SCI that happens in humans. Uh, there are several models designed for uh, making this SCI pain, contusion, cytotoxic, hemisection, ischemic models, but as used, um, I have, I put the picture of it and we will talk about it a little bit. 
why it's mostly used? Maybe because it's, there is a tool called Masses Impactor, which uh, with this, SCI can be standardized because the pressure and impact can be controlled. So uh, the experiment will be repeatable. Uh, animals after SCI show thermal and mechanical hyperalgesia in addition to spontaneous pain behaviors, for example, quality of life. Okay. Uh, there are some models for cancer pain, uh, depending on the reason of the pain. It can be, the pain can be from the cancerous tissue itself because the tissue is there. It can also be from the treatment, from the chemotherapy. There are models for both of these categories. For a tumor related pain, uh, we can have uh, pain models by local xenograft of that cancer cells. Uh, this causes mechanical and high, uh, thermal hypersensitivity and enhanced uh, palpation induced pain and movement evoked pain, which are the common symptoms in people with cancer pain. Uh, as I said, it can also be made by chemotherapy uh, um, drugs. Uh, injecting the chemotherapy agent systemically can make them uh, show mechanical and thermal hyperalgesia. Uh, there are also models for arthritic pain. Um, these can be categorized into two types. Uh, some are associated with the inflammation, some are associated with tissue damage. And there are models for both of these. Uh, for inflammation models, it can be injection of uh, the irritants that we saw in irritants part, it can be carrageenan, capsaicin, or CFA. Uh, one of the models that are, is used is injection of a collagen type 2 antibodies for making rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, it can be injected, depending on the purpose, it can be injected into single joint or, uh, for example, can be injected systemically, CFA, for example. Uh, and with that, we can have both acute and chronic inflammation. Uh, there are also models for tissue damage. Uh, for example, for osteoarthritis, there are models made by severing the anterior uh, cruciate ligament or uh, menisectomy of the knee joint or partial discectomy of the joint. It, this uh, tissue damage can also be made by injection of monosodium joint destruction and causes inflammation, which can be um, like tested by uh, checking for cytokines. Uh, they show elevated cytokine levels in their joints. Uh, pain behaviors that animals show after this type of inju induction of uh, arthritic to the joint movement and decreased uh, weight bearing on the affected limb. As you can see here, it's, um, for example, this is, a joint uh, inflammation model. You can see the difference between normal and CIA model. Uh, there are also animals for postoperative pain, uh, how they may, uh, depending on the purpose, that what kind of postoperative pain we want to mimic, uh, we can have longitudinal incisions or surgeries. Asia, muscle or a plantar aspect of the hind paw or calf or anywhere. Okay. Uh, animals after these surgeries show can both mechanical and thermal hyperalgesia and they show spontaneous behaviors too. We can see one postoperative pain model longitudinal incision on the paw and uh, the muscle. Uh, digitorium brevis will be will have a kind of longitudinal incision too, and then uh, we'll put it back and close the one. Um, there are some models for muscle pain too. Some of them uh, mimic myositis and muscle strains. Uh, they're made by ejection of an irritant into muscle. It can be again and CFA or formalin. And so it can be in depending on the purpose, it can be in hind limb, it can be in neck or facial muscles. 
uh, or anywhere else. Their symptoms are decreased mechanical withdrawal thresholds of muscle and paw, and stimuli and decreased voluntary activity which show muscle pain. There are also some models for more widespread hyperalgesia, like uh, more close to fibromyalgia, uh, or non-specific back and neck pain or myofacial pain. Uh, how are they made? They're made by repeated low-intensity insults, uh, like repeated injections. And that's why they cause long lasting and widespread hyperalgesia. It can be, for example, repeated uh, pH of four saline injections into a specific muscle. Uh, among the symptoms are decrease in activity levels and they show they do have central sensitization too. Uh, there are also models for exercise induced muscle pain that mimic the pain produced by exercise and physical activity. Uh, and they produce muscle hyperalgesia. It can be uh, models with muscle damage, like eccentric uh, contractions, which are the contracts while contraction of the muscle while uh, lengthening under uh, load. Uh, and they produce a, a kind of delay onset muscle soreness. Uh, there are also models without any tissue damage. Uh, for example, two hours of running bill activity paired with a low intensity uh, muscle insult causes long lasting and bilateral muscle and paw hyperalgesia, but as a side, damage. There are also models for visceral pain. Um, they're made by irritating the peritoneum or the hollow organs of the pelvis or abdomen. Uh, this irritation can be made by electrical current, mechanical trauma, ischemia, or chemicals. There are two common models that people use for visceral pain. Uh, the first one is acetic acid, erythening, and the second one is colorectal uh, distension models. Uh, how acetic acid erythening works, it's uh, an injection, interperitoneal uh, injection of acetic acid, and then the number of rhythmic events like a stretching, retracting, uh, pressing the belly against the floor is counted and quantified. Um, there is another model as I said for visceral pain, it's called colorectal distension model. In this model, distension of the colon is observed, a balloon will be inserted into the colon, it's inflated and the electro myographic activity evoked of abdominal will be measured and quantified. Uh, and it mimics diseases such as irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, so we are done with the first part, which is pain induction method. Now we want to look into some pain measurement methods in animals. Uh, they can be reflexive tests or they can be non-reflexive -re tests. Uh, for reflexive tests, we can uh, have mechanical, thermal, and electrical tests, which mimic evoked pain in human subjects. And for non-reflexive tests, we have spontaneous pain behaviors like leaking, like uh, withdrawals, and we can have evoked ones, or we can look into quality of life of the animal. Uh, the first and mostly used method for uh, looking into uh, reflexive behaviors as one free test. It uh, measures or allodynia, and it uses uh, one free calibrated one free filaments as you have uh, different gauges and they have different stiffnesses. Uh, with that, we can assess the amount of force that is required for behavioral response. Uh, what is that response? It's power withdrawal uh, and the time is recorded. It mimics the clinical hypersensitivity. These are, as I said, uh, the one free filaments. And this is uh, one example of the graph that you can see in different papers. For example, here, can see hypersensitivity here. Uh, 
Uh, the other uh, mechanical uh, reflexive test is Randall Salito. It's um, the animal is tested by application of pressure. It mecha uh, measures mechanical evoked pain responses. It can be used for any tissue almost. It can be muscle, joint, tail, or paw. It increasing mechanical force until a response can be seen. Um, it, the results usually are similar uh, to the previous one, one free test, but the thing is that they have different mechanical stimulation. So uh, they may activate low threshold mechanical receptors in addition to nociceptors. Um, there are also tests that look into thermal responses. For example, tail flip. That uh, the heat stimulus is applied to at the tail. It can be radiant heat or it can be hot water, like 46 centigrade degree water. Um, and the latency to remove the tail is recorded. And the interesting thing about this model is that uh, spinal reflex uh, happens in spinalized animals. I mean, if you spinalize an animal, you can still see this reflex. Uh, the other model is hot plate. It determines heat threshold. Uh, unlike the previous method, um, it integrates supraspinal pathways. So you don't see any response in uh, spinalized animals. And uh, the temperature is this, uh, remains the same over this uh, test. And the time taken to observe NAF's defensive behavior and a response is recorded. There are also models for cold stimuli testing. Uh, acetin is uh, one example. Acetin is applied, then not offensive behavior is observed. It can be counted, timed, or scored. The temperature that animal experiences during this is 15 to 21 centigrade. Uh, there is another model uh, called plantar assay, uh, which again looks into cold stimulus application. It can be wet or dry ice. It's not a direct touch. Uh, there will be a glass in between. And the temperature that animal experiences is 5 to 12 centigrade degree. And the time to pull withdrawal is recorded. Uh, there are also some non-reflexive tests that uh, are really important uh, because they are really relevant to um, like people quality of life. There are spontaneous and evoked pain behaviors. Uh, for example, in mice, you can see paw licking or paw elevation or quantification of ripening behaviors that we saw in your serial pain model. Uh, measuring paw guarding, uh, for example, in joint pain models, uh, or quantifying the weight bearing on the limb in a specific duration of walking, which is called catwalk test, uh, which is a common clinical syndrome of, symptom of a joint uh, neuropathies or uh, postoperative pain. Uh, there are also look into facial expressions of the mice. As you can see here, there is a mice, mouse grimace scale, which is a standardized, accurate, and reliable behavioral coding system. Um, how it works is because assays with moderate duration, nauseous stimuli are accompanied by facial pain expressions. So you things like closing the eyes or nose bulges, cheek bulges, or ear position or whisker changes. And um, comparing to this picture, you score, you have a score for each of these categories. You score for the pain. Uh, there are also some um, pain measurements that involve learning, like a conditioned place a preference. Uh, it starts with a preconditioning stage. It's uh, putting the animal in a box with three compartments. Uh, the light and uh, right and left chamber have different visual texture and smells, so animals can detect them. Uh, in one, they will receive analgesic drug, uh, so they uh, kind of make an association of that chamber with analgesia. And during the testing, time spent in the drug paired chamber is counted and uh, quantified. 
and it shows the preference of animal to get analgesics. Um, as the last thing uh, is the quality of life of these uh, models. Uh, patients, as patients with acute and chronic pain show a significant reduction in physical activity levels and participation in daily activities. So it's really important to look into these criteria and animal models. Um, some of the examples of quality of life that can be observed is activity, inactivity, grooming, eating, drinking, posture, gait, nesting, or social interactions between these animals and rearing behavior and real running activity. Uh, why it's interesting because um, it's been seen that some doses of analgesics uh, are effective at restoring wheel running activity. I mean, uh, after analgesic, the wheel running activity will be uh, restored, but they're uh, without any changes or reducing in mechanical hyperalgesia. So it's important to look into both of the, these uh, types of tests. And uh, also some of inflammatory and neuropathic pains that we saw uh, show very minimal changes in quality of life of animals. So that's something that maybe should be considered too. Um, as conclusions, many animal models of pain has been designed and proved useful in pain research but still there might be some modifications needed in both pain induction and pain assessment methods for getting the best results. Uh, with models of more clinical relevance, uh, translatability of preclinical studies can really be improved. And a search for the better animal model continues to include our current understanding of pathophysiology of human chronic pain, apply them in, and make and apply them in previous pain models or make new ones um, to get the best results. And these are my references. And thank you very much for listening to me. I'll be more than happy to answer if you have any questions. Okay.